All right. Well, thank you so much for having us uh, this evening. It's a privilege to be part of your program, especially during uh, Texas uh, Archaeology Month in October. Uh, we're really passionate about the site, and it's a, a great pleasure to share it with you all. Um, we're especially lucky that we decided to do this presentation by Zoom. Uh, I really don't think there's a better way to experience the history of Kreisha Brewery and the history of Texas beer than without drinking a beer. So if you're so inclined, if you want to go grab a beer from the fridge and sit here and listen to our presentation, we definitely welcome it, uh, just as long as it's not something like Keystone Light or something, craft beer preferred. Uh, but it's a really a great way to experience the story of Kreisha Brewery. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Gavin Matolka. Uh, I am the assistant sites manager here. Um, I have an anthropological background, so I don't consider myself to be an archaeologist, but I have the esteemed privilege of working with archaeologists here on site and across our agency, and then be able to use the field of archaeology here on site to kind of communicate the importance that archaeology plays uh, in our community. And I'm Jenny Townsend. I'm the educator here. Um, I do consider myself an archaeologist, um, you know, maybe just a baby archaeologist. Um, but I do especially like uh, historical archaeology and being able to combine historical records with the, you know, the objects that we find within sites and such to really get a fuller picture um, of our sites and um, archaeology. So a little bit about what you're getting yourselves into tonight. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, where we're located and why we consider these sites to be significant. Um, I'll also provide some context on the Kreischer story and what the historical record that tells us about the Kreischer Brewery. Uh, Jenny's going to dive into the archaeology of the Kreischer complex and how this archaeology inspires today's programs that we're doing throughout the year. And I'll conclude by talking about where we think we're headed with these sites and what role archaeology might play uh, in that direction. So here's where we're located in LaGrange. Um, by my understanding, we're about two hours from where you normally meet. Uh, but we like to think we're kind of halfway between Austin, San Antonio, Houston. Uh, we're re really well located for day trips from these uh, big cities. People come out here to hike. They come out here to have picnics. Uh, they come out here to experience history and to engage with the archaeology site as well. Um, just a, a really unique location that plays a pretty key um, part in the Christ story later on. Uh, many come out here to see this view. This is the view of the Colorado River uh, from the bluff to about 200 feet above that river. If I remember correctly, talking to Louis Albach, uh, his family comes from this area, the bluff community uh, near the Colorado, uh, Colorado River there. Uh, but it's a really special place. Uh, we understand that for the last thousand years or so, people have been coming up here to meet, to gather. Uh, many of them probably consider it to be a sacred place. Uh, later on, citizens of Fayette County would choose this location as a cemetery. And of course, with a view like this, it makes sense that Heinrich Kreischa would choose this place to build his home and raise his family. So again, two historic sites here, Kreischer Brewery State Historic Site and Monument Hill State Historic Site. Jenny and I both work for the Texas Historical Commission, which manages these two sites. The THC considers these to be two separate sites with different thematic messages, but because they're so close to each other, uh, they're managed uh, collectively and maintained collectively. And so oftentimes our visitors are getting to ex experience both sites. It's a two for one deal if you uh, come out and see the sites. And we'd like to share a little bit about why these sites are preserved, why the Texas Historical Commission has them as part of their state historic sites. Uh, the Kreischer Brewery site is a story of immigration. It speaks to immigrant, immigrants who shaped Texas early on. It kind of resonates when we talk about immigration and the role that immigration plays in shaping our, our state still today. We look at entrepreneurship and early Texas industry, uh, how that built community in LaGrange and kind of set an example for other neighborhoods in the area. Uh, for building a sense of community cross-culturally in many ways as well. Uh, the Kreischer family talks about this perseverance and how a uh, family um, kind of uh, developed this great sense of place um, here on the bluff, um, which is an example of how families across Texas established this sense of place and how they also uh, looked at the resources they had around them uh, to build a lifestyle for themselves. And separately from that, which we won't be focusing on uh, this evening, is Monument Hill State Historic Site. Um, it preserves the burial place for soldiers who were killed in the Dawson Massacre and the uh, ill-fated Demeter Expedition. Uh, so there's a tomb here and then a monument built in 1936 that commemorates those uh, incidents. Uh, but we use this to tell a story of the Republic of Texas, a nation building in the early country of Texas, 
and the honor and sacrifice that took place as part of that. But we're here to talk about that immigrant story, uh, Heinrich Kreischa and him coming to Texas, uh, starting uh, his businesses here, including the Kreischa Brewery. Uh, we like to visit a little bit about why Heinrich Kreischa chose to leave Germany. He was raised in uh, Gatkatro, Saxony, now part of Germany. Um, he grew up, uh, 1821 is when he's born. He probably apprentices as a stonemason early on in his life. He goes to a pretty well-respected trade school and develops that skill as a stonemason and has devoted his life to being uh, this well-trained, uh, well-respected uh, stonemason, at least early on. Now, Europe in the 1840s is going through a lot of changes. Many young people in Germany are looking to form a collection of states, um, po possibly modeled after the United States. Uh, so German-speaking um, states un unifying around this united idea. Uh, but they're also facing overpopulation, consolidation, industrialization. People like Heinrich Kreischer, other artisans, farmers are looking are having difficulty uh, applying their trades in their communities. And so they turn to the United States as a place where they might apply their trades. And so Heinrich Kreischer is going to come over um, along with a lot of Germans in the early 1840s uh, before the big rush of Germans in about 1848 or so. And Heinrich Kreischer, along with his brother and lots of other Germans, are lured here by several German settlements in Texas. But the famous one would have been the Edelsverein, which was a German noble organization that wanted to establish a German colony in the um, Republic of Texas era, later on the state of Texas. They acquire some property in the Fredericksburg area, and then they encourage people to come from Germany to settle that area. Uh, help provide some of the, the starting um, the ways to get started in that area as well. Um, the Edelsbring uh, is poorly managed and it eventually fall, fails, uh, but still this pattern of encouraging Germans to come to Texas, settle um, and apply their trades here and start uh, this huge German uh, population that's still uh, very relevant to our state today, kind of begins with these ideas of these German settlements. So Heinrich Kreischer settles near Fredericksburg or is attracted to Fredericksburg initially. We don't know whether he lived there for very long, the property that he was given and purchased. Uh, we don't know if there were any structures uh, built out there, um, but we do know that probably within a year or two of arriving in Texas, he eventually finds himself in LaGrange. And so he's uh, starting his family here uh, in LaGrange. He'll eventually marry uh, about seven years after he arrives in Fayette County to another German immigrant from uh, who had settled uh, south of LaGrange uh, in the Houtsville and Wabaka area. Um, and then they raised their uh, six kids who were born between about 1856 and the uh, 1860s or so. And they, the family has a huge presence on the bluff and the, Christ, the bluff later becomes known as Christ of Bluff because the family has such uh, a major influence on the community here and that, that place of prominence overlooking the Colorado River. The family uh, led by Heinrich Kreischer uh, are well known as stonemasons. That's where the money for building his success uh, starts out with. He's well regarded, um, sought after to build projects in town. There's many people still in the LaGrange area today that mention that they have um, chimneys or other portions of their house that was constructed uh, by Heinrich Kreischer. Some of these are possibly true. Some of them are probably not true. Um, but then there's other structures in town. Uh, he, he helped build the county jail. Uh, he built the courthouse seen here, which predates the Fayette County court, Courthouse that is standing today. Um, and then bars and other structures in town that were kind of central for gathering places, especially for Germans. But on the bluff itself, the property uh, preserved by Kreischer Brewery State Historic Site, he's responsible for several structures. Uh, based on old tradition, uh, he constructed the original tomb and vault that holds the remains of soldiers uh, from the Dawson and Muir expeditions. He's gonna build his impressive house on the bluff. Um, he builds the roads that are on his property but we also have evidence that suggests he was the road commissioner for Fayette County at one point. So it was probably responsible for several of the roads that went off his property. And so he's um, helping maintain the road network uh, from his property to LaGrange and points beyond. Um, we know that Christia helped start the social club that was a shooting club, but more just a uh, get together organization called the Schutzenverein that met up here on the bluff. And we think that he helped contribute to the structures that were part of the Schutzenfreund Pavilion and uh, that complex. These were based on photographs, primarily wooden structures, but still he, liked, he and his family were involved in the construction of that complex um, because they were involved in hosting this mass of people that came up on a monthly basis 
to celebrate German heritage, get together, shoot some guns, drink some beer um, at that Schutz and Verein. And of course, uh, Heinrich Kreischer was responsible for developing the Kreischer Brewery, which is the namesake for our state historic site. So when we're looking at the historical record of uh, the folks with Texas Parks and Wildlife who started the archaeology back in the 70s, and as we continue to explore the historical record today, we're asking kind of those who, why, what, when questions to try to understand um, uh, the context of the Kreischer Brewery. Um, I've got these kind of in the who, why, what, when order because they're going from uh, where we know fairly definitively who was responsible to uh, when, as there's some debate as to where some of uh, when some of the brewery was operating. Uh, so who worked at the Kreischer Brewery? In 1860, Heinrich Kreischer uh, lists himself as a stonemason. And then in the 1870 census, that top picture there off the right, uh, Heinrich Kreischer lists himself as a brewer. Uh, 10 years later, Heinrich Kreischer again lists himself as a brewer and his two oldest sons list themselves as brewers as well. Uh, there's also inside the Kreischer house or nearby boarders that are living on the Kreischer property who list themselves as laborers and it's quite likely that they're laborers for the brewery. Uh, they might have also assisted with Heinrich Kreischer's projects, but they're all immigrants from Germany. Heinrich Kreischer is maintaining this household and network of Germans that are going to work uh, for him on his projects as a stonemason in the brewery as well. Tax and registration documents point toward Heinrich Kreischer being the owner of the brewery up until his death in 1882, but then uh, that gets transferred to his wife, Josepha, who is listed as the owner of the brewery from 1882 to 1884 when it closed. Uh, she's likely one of the three uh, first uh, female brewers in Texas or brewery owners in Texas, and she's almost certainly one of the last uh, female brewery owners before uh, it became a much more commercial corporate uh, exercise in the late 1880s. Um, so next question, why beer? Uh, the simple answer to this is why not? Um, Krisha was definitely passionate about beer. He comes from this uh, background of wanting to brew beer. A couple of years ago, we were working with um, folks in the archives in Saxony in Germany. And we came across a petition from Johann Kreischer, which was Heinrich Kreischer's father, in which um, he's making this argument to open up a beer and brandy hall in the Kreischer family basement. Uh, his argument is that he wants to create this place where people can come together to drink beer. It's safe, uh, promotes the economy of the local region, um, collects taxes, things like that. And he's not successful in his petition, but perhaps this idea resonates with Heinrich Kreischer, who some 30 years later, uh, thinks, hey, I want to bring beer to my community as well. Uh, at the time the Kreischer Brewery is operating, uh, there's probably somewhere between 75 or more uh, breweries in the triangle uh, bounded by Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, which is pretty impressive because up until about 30 years ago, there was probably only a handful of breweries in the state of Texas, those big national brand breweries. Uh, but we're working on localized production. Uh, you want fresh beer, you go to the local brewery to get fresh beer, you're not going to travel more than a few miles. So Heinrich Kreischer recognizes that he can provide beer to within a few mile radius of where uh, he's living. And then we also see in the newspapers this pattern of apprenticeships and partnerships among Texas brewers, where Germans are popping up at different breweries, doing things, going and opening up their own brewery. They will form partners and divide and find new ways to start brewers. And we suspect that sometime in the 1860s, Christian might have been part of this, um, bopping around at some breweries to learn the trade. A big question is, what were they brewing? Um, there's a, a wide variety of beers that some of you might be familiar with today. Uh, Heinrich Christian comes from a background where lager beer is pretty, uh, pretty important. That's part of the German culture. Um, for 200 plus years in the United States, uh, Americans are familiar with ale. Um, lager beer requires cold, uh, fermentation to be able to, to get that flavor, whereas ale can be um, fermented at warmer temperatures. That's a British tradition. Um, a lot of people in the US were familiar with that more ale um, type of beer. And by the 1840s and really more into the 1860s and 70s, people are introduced uh, to lager uh, thanks to those Germans. Uh, the big question is, well, how the heck do they keep um, beer cool in the hot temperatures of, of uh, Texas? You can imagine from you know, late February to early November, temperatures just aren't very consistent. Um, up in St. Louis, where it does get cold, we know that those brewers are using ice to cool their facilities to make lager. 
So we often wonder, well, how they manage to do that in a place like Texas? We do know that other breweries um, were producing lager based on newspaper articles. They advertised their lagers. Mangers Western Brewery in San Antonio, Schneider's City Brewery in Austin, Peter Gable's Brewery in Houston, all talk about brewing lager beer. And they likely have some sort of tavern system uh, to keep their beer uh, cool, uh, following the same tradition that they might have learned in Germany, where aging beer in caves uh, helps achieve that, uh, that lager technique. And then the biggest part of debate that we have among historians and archaeologists is when the, the brewery is operational. Uh, oral tradition speaks to the brewery opening about 1860. Uh, it's a little bit earlier than what we tend to argue nowadays. There's just not a whole lot of evidence that the 1860s to Heinrich Kreischer brewing, the Civil War is going on. It's difficult to start a brewery during those times. Uh, but there are two interesting pieces of evidence that suggest he might have had some interest in brewing. Uh, the first one is that picture off to the right. A newspaper in LaGrange lists um, what the grocer is selling. And down at the bottom, you can see lager beer. Uh, one of the lager beers is a German beer served in the bottle. And then beneath it is some sort of bluff lager beer served by the glass. So we figure, well, you're not going to serve lager beer in a glass unless it's fairly local. So it's possible that High Price was doing some sort of experimental brewing as early as 1861. Uh, one of my favorite letters is um, from 1864. It's uh, this guy in San Antonio that's trying to convince uh, Heinrich Kreischer to buy hops. We don't have any evidence that suggests that Kreischer had purchased those hops, but clearly he's got some sort of interest in brewing at this time uh, for him to offer the, the hops. Uh, I'd like to point out some of the dates here. So the date is 1864. The guy selling these hops is saying that they're about a year old that he got from uh, Matamoros. Um, so these hops would have been smuggled across the Rio Grande during the, during the Civil War. And from Kreischer's obituary, uh, we know him to be a, a staunch supporter of the Union during the Civil War. Um, so we don't know whether he would have been uh, keen on such activities, but hey, business is business. So most of our data and information about when the brewery was operational comes from the 1870s. Uh, we see the first time that he's buying supplies for a brewery based on the census schedule of manufacturing in the 1870s. All the key ingredients that take part in uh, brewing beer are listed there. We see a very significant increase in the property tax valuation in 1871. It increases about uh, four times what he was paying in 1869, 1870. Um, and then it kind of stays that way up until 1881 and then drops pretty significantly. So that lines up with where we think the brewing is happening. Uh, beginning in the 1870s, people from across Texas are writing in German uh, newspapers saying, hey, I, I just popped by this brewery. I saw precious cellars. I saw him brewing beer in a cellar, um, and it tastes better than beer being brewed on ice. And then local newspapers really start heavily emphasizing Kreischer beer in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And part of that is likely because the Schützenverein is formed at that time. And so Heine Kreischer has this reason to bring people up to the bluff to celebrate. He's got this group kind of trapped around the bluff where he can sell his beer to. And then the, uh, the other part is high prices opening uh, bars and working with uh, other people who are opening bars in LaGrange. And so he's able to uh, kind of promote beer that way too. So the most production happens in the late 1870s. We know from the ledger, uh, we have pages of ledgers from the 1870, late 1870s to the early 1880s. We suspect there's more ledgers, we just don't have them, but that helps us put a, a good idea on when the brewery was in its heyday. And then, uh, uh, the distribution network by which um, the brewery was operational. So the brewery complex that is represented down there today, the ruins of which, that massive operation, the complexity, the scale at which Kreischer Brewery, we kind of think we're pinpointing on that time period from about 1870-ish to 1884. Um, and it's possible that he's doing some small scale brewing uh, in the vicinity before that, but that big uh, brewery operation was happening uh, probably sometime after 1871 or so. Okay, so Gavin told you a lot about the evidence uh, that we have through historic records, which helps us to contextualize the archaeology of the sites a little bit more. Um, and it's essential to understand the site in a more complete way with you know, written thoughts and official records. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the archaeology conducted on site at this point, specifically what happened down at the brewery. Um, there was some work done directly outside of the brewery and then up at the house, uh, by the smokehouse and barn, et cetera. 
um, which is also fascinating and, and provides a peek into the life of the Kreischer family who lived on the land for a little over 100 years. But for today, uh, just because there's so much, I'm going to focus on the rooms of the brewery um, itself and how it has informed our knowledge of the brewing process and subsequently our interpretation. Um, now, I should say, by no means is the interpretation perfect. We're still learning new things every day about the possibilities for the room uses. Uh, but this report gives us a basic idea based on where the archaeology was found in the 70s and 80s. You can see the left picture there, that is before the excavation uh, started. You can kind of see the uh, brewery as it would have been, like in ruins without any maintenance. And then you see on the right side, that's after the excavation. So it shows that it's a much better shape at that point. The stabilization is in effect that they did in the 80s. They added boardwalks to the, the top ground floor of the brewery so everybody could kind of peek inside. Um, and it was just a, a safer feature and something that uh, you could use within the park system to, to learn more about the brewery. All right, so uh, beginning of the excavations, we should start with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife purchasing at the Kreischer Brewery land, which was approximately uh, 40 acres, and that included Monument Hill. And that happened in 1977. Uh, they acquired this land from the Frisch Off Corporation, which was a land developer that was attempting to convert the lot into like a themed Bavarian neighborhood, um, but it was uh, not successful. Um, but uh, much of the land around the house and brewery was disturbed due to their land development. Uh, so excavations really started immediately afterward uh, in summer of 1978 and summer of 1979 uh, with stabilization in the 1980s. Um, and the report that I have on the right there, uh, that is what I'm sourcing all of my information from tonight. Um, and that wasn't finished until 2001, which means there's a bit of a gap between gathering the data and information and then actually creating an assessment um, in the final report. That's like, what, 25, 30 years or so? Um, and there were field notes and research that we currently have here that helps to inform the final report. Uh, but some things ultimately did get lost in the shuffle including a few collections that we are still trying to hunt down within our archives. Um, I should also mention that Texas Historical Commission took over in about 2019. So we're still kind of in that transition period from Texas Parks and Wildlife to THC as well. So TPWD had three main goals for the excavation. One, they wanted to do a general archeological assessment. Two, they wanted to stabilize the brewery to halt any further dilapidation of the ruins. And then three, they wanted to have a better understanding of the brewing methods of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, which was uh, in turn used, uh, we use in our everyday uh, tours and programs that we do. Now, before I read this slide, I wanna point out the topographic map there um, on the right. Kreischer Brewery is at the bottom of a very steep decline, a ravine that you know, goes 100 feet down below from where Kreischer's house is. Um, and at the very top is a spring head where Kreischer sourced his water for the brewery. Um, using gravity, Kreischer tapped into the natural flow of water and put his brewery right in the middle of it, which you know is great from a business perspective, like while it was running, but um, natural erosion and alluvial deposition um, are inevitable when you do that. So, especially since you know, almost 100 years since the brewery was in operation when they started the excavations. Um, and so the power that Kreischer harnessed for his brewery also became a downfall without maintenance. Um, though we should give credit to um, that the brewery did stay in such good shape for as long as it did. Um, there's a bit of a, it's a bit of a testament to Kreischer's good handiwork as a stonemason that the walls were in the state that they were. Um, you can kind of see it a little bit uh, behind the goals there, what it looks like. Um, another major disturbance to consider going into the excavations was that the brewery became a popular spot for uh, tourists and visitors to come and picnic, have a good afternoon and explore. Uh, this means that there is a significant amount of looting, taking souvenirs and such, and that limits uh, some of the knowledge of our operations because we don't have those artifacts. Um, even large artifacts such as machine parts were taken and salvaged. Um, we actually have oral histories that say that a lot of the brewing machine parts were taken as uh, metal scraps during World War I. Uh, trash and litter were also found post abandonment from the picnickers. Um, you know, that's still very good information for us to assess like what was happening in the 20th century. And a lot of that was considered trash, but not really. That's in our collections as well. 
Um, so here are a few photos that I have here of our picnickers. Um, we probably have photos from the late 1890s and into the 20th century. Um, and this can include photographs with writing on them, postcards that make their way back to Germany and more. So those really do kind of give us like hints into, uh, into who was coming here and such. Um, and as you can see, all of these pictures of the brewery are in a state of disrepair. Um, we actually don't have a picture of the brewery as it would have been in its heyday. Uh, we only have the later photos kind of, you know, starting in the 1890s and such. So there is one silver lining to these picnickers coming. We at least have their photographs to better understand what the brewery looks like, even if it was, you know, starting to break down, especially that third floor, which would have been a wooden um, superstructure. So this is the front of the brewery that you're seeing from all of these pictures. This would have been facing the Kreischer Road that Gavin mentioned earlier that uh, connected all of the, the towns kind of together and went down to the uh, Colorado River and everything. This is the uh, considered the uh, back of the brewery. This would have been the way that Kreischer would come down to work. Uh, if you go just, you know, past the picture and, you know, up 100 feet or so, that's going to be where Kreischer's house is. So it's, it's fairly close. It's probably a, a very good commute to work, but, you know, might be a little dangerous at nighttime because it's very steep to go up and down. Um, and then the picture on the left here shows an open area where the visitors are. You can kind of you can kind of see it, those visitors that are there. Um, it kind of looks like people, you know, enjoy selling beer within that brewery. And, you know, the pictures have been misleading, though. Um, if we're looking at the archaeology of that part of the third level, that would be where the millstone would have been to grind up the barley for the uh, brewing process. So that's where horses or other livestock uh, would have been connected to a power source through the brewery, uh, not where people would have been having, you know, a, a good time while you know, Kreischer Brewery was in operation. So that just shows there is a difference in, in what these picnickers who are coming in and just taking pictures to be with the ruins rather than like what was actually happening um, during, you know, the brewery heyday. Um, you can also see evidence of the roof and how grand the third floor would have looked in these pictures um, and how it's kind of built into the ravine. Um, yeah, you can just kind of see it a little bit more uh, than you can these days because that, of course, that whole entire third floor is just now gone. So let's talk about the excavations. Um, there's essentially three main levels of the brewery, plus uh, there is an intermediate level between um, two floors as well. The third floor, uh, which is what we call the upper brewery, and the ground floor was originally that wooden superstructure that I was talking about. Um, and it was also the first of the brewery to fall. It's also wooden compared to the stone, um, actually the stone mason, of course. Um, and this wooden portion may have been cleared up by Free Shop Corporation once they took over in the um, 1960s. Uh, the second floor right here, that is uh, the main brewing area. So that's where a lot of the uh, 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 malting and the brewing and everything would have occurred. Yeah, uh, this was the main floor of the brewery, but because of the collapse of the third floor, it was covered in debris and alluvium deposits that needed excavation. So previous owners had created trenches in the area. It had been a little bit disturbed and much of the large brewing equipment had um, already been taken as keepsakes or salvaged and such. And then we also have the first floor, which you can't really see from this picture, but it would include this right here and then a room that's underneath this area right here. Uh, that is the only one, to, this level is the only one to have a room that is still intact, which is the cellar or the vaulted room. So let's go ahead and start talking about level one, which are those two rooms that I just talked about. Okay, so. Floor number one includes the cave room, which is called room number six and the cellar, room number seven. No excavations were conducted in these two rooms. Breach off had already cleaned up the rooms when they had taken ownership. So there really wasn't much else that uh, they could have been able to find within them. Um, and there wasn't really actually much excavation on this level until a later seasons when they wanted to know a little bit more about the uh, water system that Kreischer was using. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in a later slide. Some interesting things to point out here, though, is that the cave room 
uh, you know, it's generally considered storage. It's an example of Kreisha building spurring into a natural landscape so that it could be, you know, just to be used to his advantage. He was really thinking about like the resources that he had um, at his disposal, including having a room made out of food. Also of note, uh, the cellar was accessible to tourists. So uh, there is evidence of both natural growth over time. We've got the walls with mineral formations um, on one side, and you can see that on the left. And then there's also human activity as well, graffiti on the walls, which I find particularly interesting because it's really showing uh, you know, its own story in post-abandonment as well. Floor two uh, consists of the main brewing area, which is rooms one and two. Room one is subdivided into two rooms with three air vents in the middle, which connect to the room below, which would have been the cellar, and uh, two openings in the floor as well. Evidence of canvas hose was found near these two holes. Room two is another main brewing area of a similar size, and then there's also two other rooms, four and five, which we're interpreting as the malting room and then the room for wooden, um, room five is for like wooden storage. Now there's not too much archeology span for room five, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about that further on, but I'm gonna talk about the other three rooms. Uh, so the stratigraphy of this floor was especially interesting as it held a lot of the alluvial deposition of almost hundred years of dilapidation and roof debris from a V3 floor collapse. The soil deposits were on top of stone floors within the brewery. So much of the excavation was to determine the layering and depositional uh, rate of different soils and to see if any um, artifacts could be recovered within these layers. Room one, which is kind of, you know, the middle room, it was part of the main brewing area. And that's uh, all of this right here. This would be room one. Uh, that was originally thought to be where fermentation took place for the brewing process. But uh, archaeology shows this to be full of used and new barrel hoops, uh, barrel rivets, a pitch nozzle, hose, and other artifacts that indicate this may have been a room for barrel repairs and general cleaning and maintenance of storage barrels. Um, fun fact for you, there were a total of 589 barrel hoops that were found in the collection during these excavations. Um, much of them were found in the smokehouse by the Kreisha house. So they're not in situ, but um, many were found here at the bottom of the deposition in this room. So that possibly indicates that this was actually where the repair would have been done, just because it was, you know, where it, you know, it was originally deposited. Um, and then also there is that hole in the ground that I talked about. That is where um, some hose were found, um, indicating the area was used to reach the cellar and bring down either beer or water into the cellar room. Uh, room two is right next to that barrel room I was just talking about, and that's where a significant amount of debris from the fall on third level was excavated. Artifacts recovered from this room were largely concurrent with uh, post-abandonment. There were a number of glass shards from food and beverage bottles. This was probably a waste disposal site for picnickers who probably did not uh, venture into this area because of the debris from the third floor. Once fully excavated, uh, the flooring showed a general slope to the northwest with a row of flat square stones set at 45 degrees, okay. yep. 45 degree angle to create a shallow channel to move water toward the drain hole in the northwest corner of the room. So it was designed to drain some sort of liquid here. Um, we're not completely sure exactly what the room's use was outside of that, but the proximity to the warding room might indicate that this is where the cooling happened after the wart reached its ideal boiling uh, point. Um, additional excavations found a pipe from cisterns to the tunnel under the cellar here as well, and you can see in those pictures there. Um, that is showing the elaborate uh, system of uh, bringing water to different parts of the brewery. All right, now going on to room four. This is the uh, malt kiln, which is the first part of the process of making beer. Malting is when you uh, germinate the grain or the barley so that the starches convert to sugars. Uh, you first start uh, with steeping the barley. Uh, water and barley is put into a tank, left together for a few days, and then laid out on um, what's called couching. And this is where the barley was laid out on a flat surface to sprout. 
Um, the iron joints that you see here would have been uh, where some perforated metal would have been put on, and then uh, the barley would have been laid on top of that uh, for that germinating process. There is a bit of a better schematic showing um, the whole entire system of uh, a, a flue system that would have been found here, which uh, has rough stone pilings that support ascending rows of thin rectangular tabs of stone, kind of look like stair steps. Um, the flue would guide the heat from the firebox uh, throughout the room and then exit a uh, chimney in the northwest corner of the room. So this is essentially where the malt would be dried uh, in this cone. Now we're going to talk about level 2.5, which is uh, part of the southeast portion of the brewery. Um, the, the landing for this would have been on the third level and it would have gone um, to 2.5. Um, this is where the warting was done. Uh, the rooms consist of stairs and pits that are square at the bottom and come uh, circular at the top. Um, and there were a good amount, there were a good amount of charcoal and ash found in these rooms, additionally um, an iron door and three barrel hoops. So uh, warding is another essential part of the brewing process. It's where the malt is uh, boiled and then hops are added to give beer distinct flavors and aromas. So uh, eventually it must be cooled to begin the fermentation process, which we think happened in room two. Um, and you can see on the right there, that is a copper brewing vat that would have been in this room. Um, it is slightly altered from its original use to accommodate a bigger volume. And we suspect that's something that Crush did later on um, because he needed more room. And finally, we are talking about floor three here. That's the ground surface. It's uh, where the wooden construction portion of the brewery um, uh, was that you know, mainly collapsed after its abandonment. And it's most notable for its stone step entrance that goes into the second floor. And then also has the remnants of a grist mill in the southern portion of the ground area in the cistern. There's the grist mill, there's the cistern. Um, we do not know of particular rooms at this level because of the collapse. And then artifacts consisted mainly of 20th century trash, mainly. Uh, but we did recover iron items, cut nails, uh, galvanized iron, other scraps, and uh, some horse trappings and slump deposits uh, near the grist mill. So that might indicate that there was um, some sort of machine working there, and then also that it was probably horse powered or some sort of livestock powered uh, that portion. Um, excavations around the cistern were conducted to better understand the water system found on the second uh, level and the tunnel system underneath the cellar. Kreisch's use of the water system within the, his brewery is another great case study of uh, Kreisch's ingenuity and manipulation of the land to create a lab water system. And as we like to point out in our tours, the central ingredient for creating a good beer is water. And in order to create a lager, cooler temperatures are needed for fermentation, as Gavin said earlier. So this meant that a space would be necessary that for several months of the year needed to be at 50 degrees or lower in order for the lager to uh, be produced. So Kresha therefore created a tunnel and pipe system within the flowing spring water uh, that would bring water to various parts of the brewery and cause evaporative cooling within the cellar and brewery as well. So I told you a little bit earlier about the uh, spring head being at the very top of the ravine, very top of the ravine, kind of up here out of sight. The water would flow down here to the holding pond, and once it would get to a certain level, it would fall into the spillway and end up in these settling tanks, which we think were just some sort of filtering was happening here because there are two different tanks that they would have to go through. And uh, eventually it would go into a um, iron lead yeah, lead pipe that would eventually go into the cistern here. And once a certain level of overflow is achieved, it would go into a tunnel that's underneath the cellar and evaporative cooling would make this cellar room um, at that ideal uh, 50 degrees. The water after it ran through here would continue on outside of the brewery and into some more drainage that's up outside of the brewery. So it is a pretty elaborate system um, and very interesting. Um, this is a spillway that I was talking about leading to the filtration tanks. Um, this is a little bit more close up here, and you can see the piping here. Eventually goes into, you can barely see it, but that is where the cistern is, and the brewery is just 
for this. So artifacts, um, a couple of the brewery related artifacts that we found, or we found, that they found in the 70s and 80s include uh, the barrel hoops that I mentioned earlier, beer bottles, mugs, uh, bung bushes, which are bees, uh, firebox door funnels. We've got a hose here um, as well. You know, there's some glasses as well. Um, evidence of animal husbandry. I talked a little bit about that being kind of by the uh, grist mill area. And then um, there's also a lot of evidence of construction and masonry artifacts, because we know that Kreisha was continuing to be a mason, even though he was officially considered a brewer on the census. He was still building things, improving things, probably working on his house. And we know that he had projects uh, downtown uh, to his death, actually. In 1882, he was working on an ice house down there. We also have a lot of domestic and personal items that are up at the house. We do not have enough time to really go through all of those, but it is pretty fascinating to go through and learn more about kind of the everyday life of Kreisha, his wife, and his six children. Um, and then one thing of particular note is that there are a lot of recycled objects that are found within the brewery, things that were broken, that were uh, repurposed or reused for other purposes, and you can kind of tell um, the different uses of them um, as uh, you're going through them. Uh, one thing in particular is that there are a lot of bottles that were coming from different bottle companies that were just reused for precious beer um, from all kinds of different areas of the country. Here are a couple of more brewery uh, artifacts that we have in our collections. We've got the thermometer here that is actually in our visitor center at the moment. We've got a barrel spigot, um, a wooden cog, which would have helped with the uh, malting process to, to separate out the sugars and everything and then um, also the grinding wheel. So um, archeology span is part of our mission-driven focus at Kreischer Brewery. So we are really always trying to incorporate it, um, our understanding of the archeology span um, into the programs that uh, we run. So we have a lot of examples of um, interpretive tours. We make sure that every uh, tourist or uh, docent that we have uh, has read the archaeological reports better understand really that brewing process because that is where we're getting a lot of our information from um, that and then also our, our own knowledge of the brewing process. We also use archaeology for our living history. You can see on the left here, this is a Cooper. He is a living historian that goes around to different sites and such and uh, shows his, his practice of creating barrels from, um, from scratch and using the barrel rings and everything. Um, we also, um, on a monthly basis, we open up the smokehouse that is on site, um, and we did excavations around here. We, uh, we, uh, sorry. yeah, so we, uh, we use the uh, smokehouse in, in a way of uh, bringing uh, communities together uh, with sausage and such to just show what it would have been like back then. Uh, this is. One thing that we also do, this is the bluff shoots and dust. Uh, as Gavin mentioned earlier, we have the shoots and rind. Um, they would all come up and gather on the bluff. They would come and drink beer and such. So we just, in that same spirit um, and our knowledge of everyone coming up together, we, uh, for the first time this year, we did a bluff shoots and fest where we got all of the community to come together to dance, to, to celebrate. We did a laser uh, rifle shooting competition to kind of commemorate the pink shoots. Um, and of course, we had beer to drink. And then we also do um, Archaeology Month. It's all the month of October. We just had our last Saturday. It was really successful. Um, we were teaching about the methodologies of archaeologists. We have a touch table with a lot of the surface finds that we found here on the site. We have a Munzel soil station here. And then, of course, um, mock days and such. So really getting kids to, to feel inspired to come archaeologists themselves and learn more about the importance of preserving the history of the past. So <clears throat> I'll conclude here uh, talking about kind of where we're headed from here. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, uh, our sites uh, were one of uh, some of the sites that were transferred to the Historical Commission from Texas Parks and Wildlife back in uh, September of 2019. Uh, the other sites that were that went along with us were Washington, the Brazos and San Jacinto. Um, so there's a lot of analysis that's happening as part of this post-transfer analysis. Um, 
uh, we're going into the archaeological collection in Austin and really examining artifacts. Uh, we're bringing about um, some of the documents that are related to the Kreisha family that never had a chance to be translated or transcribed. So we're working with groups in Austin and Dallas uh, to look at some of these written documents, uh, hopefully painting a better picture of the, the Kreischer Brewery operation. Uh, we're also uh, going back and looking at those field notes. As uh, Danny was mentioning, there's that gap between when these field notes were collected in the 70s and 80s and when the final report that we use was written in 2001. And so going back and looking at, uh, re-looking at these field notes to see what else we can glean from as we improve our interpretation. And it seems like every day we're imp improving our knowledge of the site and the contextual history through the newspaper records. I'm sure y'all are familiar with Portal Texas history. It's been an incredible resource for us uh, to pinpoint some of the, the stories associated with Kreisha. Um, there's a lot of German language newspapers out there that I can simply copy and paste into Google Translate, uh, which is just a tool that they, they wouldn't have had uh, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, that's adding a lot to our knowledge base for these sites. Um, we're doing some cool future projects here. Uh, we're doing a, uh, some work kind of on the archaeology of yeast. Uh, back in 2019, we worked with a brewer and chemist who um, pulled some samples of yeast from the cellar and then in the general biome of the brewery. And then uh, a couple of years later, was able to use that yeast to brew, produce a five gallon batch of beer uh, loosely inspired by the Kreisch story. It's probably the closest we've ever come to tasting what Kreisch's beer might have tasted like. And inspired by that same, same vein, we just started a partnership with Community Cultures Yeast Lab in San Antonio. Uh, they do a lot of yeast projects around Texas, um, finding wild strains of yeast, uh, partnering with breweries to create better forms of yeast. And so we're working with them uh, in our collection and on our site to try to identify strains of yeast that might be more closely associated with the crisis story, and then hopefully partnering with breweries who might want to tell the story of Texas history through beer uh, using some of these yeast, using some of these strains of yeast that they might find. And then uh, lastly, uh, we've been referencing the Bluff Schützenfreund, that social organization that met up here on the Bluff that Kreischer was instrumental in establishing back in the 1870s. There's some oral history references to some, uh, some investigations being done, but it's pretty limited. We've just started some research into the historical record on the Bluff Schutz and Frying, and we're looking forward to the next several years of exploring this history. So when we talk about the Bluff and the Chrysler Brewing being a place of gathering for the community, a place where LaGrange and the surrounding community was built, came together, uh, it's best exemplified by the Bluff Schutz and Frying as pavilion. And so we're really excited to explore this part of history because um, it also inspires the events and programs we're doing here. And we, we suspect that sometime in the future, uh, archaeology will play a, a key role in investigating uh, that Bluff Schutz and Frying even further. So with that, uh, we again, thank you so much for um, uh, letting us present to you and sharing the history of the Chrysler Brewery. We hope you'll come out and visit if you have been out before. Uh, there's a lot of great things to come out here and do, attend a tour on the weekends, uh, great events coming up. We've got a uh, Spooky Stories event happening at the end of the month. Uh, we have Trail of Lights happening in December that combines some <clears throat> modern elements with the uh, German tradition, uh, German traditions associated with Christmas that we'll also be showcasing. Um, so lots of events, but just uh, we're open seven days a week. You can come up and see the history and archaeology of Pressure Brewery. So, thanks again. Thank you, Gavin and Jenny. Really interesting. And I'm going to read some questions to you that are in the chat. And also Sarah Chesney will pipe up if there are any questions in the YouTube chat. First of all, were the lead pipes that you mentioned problematic in retrospect? Did they cause toxicity or would that have been boiled out of the water at some point? Uh, I, there's, no, there's no record that shows that that would have been um, specifically problematic. Um, and we don't have any evidence to suggest that it would have been boiled out of the water. Did, did you mention lead pipes? So those pipes that uh, connect the holding tank to the cistern were most likely, or lead. Yeah, mm -hmm. they've, they've been replaced since the, yeah. the, with the stabilization efforts. So, but maybe it was just a minimal, minimal contact or? There's no written re record of anybody complaining. Okay. okay. They, they didn't know. They just drank the beer. That's they right. just drank the beer, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, okay. plenty of other things they were dying from. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. 
And then the wooden clog artifact that you found is really interesting. Do you know if there have been, uh, I know this is a European Germanic article of clothing. Are there any mm -hmm. similar finds in Texas or is, uh, do you guys have the only wooden clog in Texas to your historic wooden clog? Mm -hmm. You run across those elsewhere? It's uh, used pretty often within uh, breweries for that vaulting um, process. Um, so it, uh, it's wooden, it, it helps to really uh, separate the starches uh, within the malting. So it, it um, yeah, there were definitely some, we actually have a picture from Manger Hotel or Manger Brewery where they have the clogs kind of, it kind of looks like it's, it's a bit placed, but um, you see them in that picture. So we, we do know that there's like evidence of it in um, other breweries. And we only have one that we found. Yeah, in the they're wearing these when they're uh, going through and raking the, the wet malt. So part of this is to uh, lessen the damage being caused by your feet on that malt and also try to keep your feet dry during that process. That's interesting. I think you mentioned this at the beginning of your presentation, but originally he was a stonemason. And did he help build that wonderful jail that's still standing in LaGrange? Do you know? No, so the building that jail still standing? That standing was built in uh, 1882 when that contract went out. So just like, uh, yeah, it was just a, actually a few weeks after his death when they announced contracts to replace Croce's jail. So, mm -hmm. so are there are a few buildings still in LaGrange that he did build as a stonemason? Yeah, so um, down on the square, there is a now real estate office that is the last building that Chrysler built. It was an ice house where we suspect he intended to sell his beer. Um, and uh, during the process of building that structure, according to oral tradition, he was crushed by a wagon load of stone and then a few months or a few weeks later died from a kidney infection. So mm -hmm. when we go, uh, we're good friends with the folks at that real estate office and we go in, we kind of like try to figure out which stone in here was the one that killed Chrysler. Interesting. Betsy, Red, uh, I have a question, Betsy. Go ahead, Bob. Um, uh, have you guys managed to track down and or contact any descendants of Crucci? So Chrysler had six children, none of them married. Uh, so there are no direct descendants of Heinrich Chrysler. Uh, oh. His brother came to the U.S. with him. Uh, there are some descendants on the brother's side. And then his wife, Josepha Appelt, uh, her family's from um, the um, Hallettsville area. And ha Appelt is still a pretty common name in that area. And so we've got people that will come up and say, hey, my great, great aunt or whoever uh, used to live here. So that's our closest connection. But nothing directly related to the brewery. Right. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we got any other questions here. Here's another comment about the wooden clogs. They were worn on feet to prevent slipping and contamination from footwear, which you all mentioned. That's interesting. Any other questions, either by chat or unmute yourself? There are no questions coming in from the YouTube as of yet. Oh, uh, as of yet. But just um, a thank you for an awesome presentation. Do y'all know, uh, I, I had read when I was researching uh, the Kreischer Brewery that uh, he was a little bit ahead of his time and he was also a distributor for Anheuser-Busch. Uh, how long did he do that? And did you ever find any of the original Budweiser bottles? We did uh, down at Frost Town. Bob, you could probably talk on that. That was before my time with, well, with yeah, us. Yes, it was you did. It an was original very, bottle. Very, very early. I, I, I can't remember the, the time period, but it was a very early Anheuser-Busch uh, bottle. Yeah. Probably from the German, obviously from the, the German settlement. Yeah. So we don't have any of the Anheuser-Busch uh, in, in our collection. Um, uh, Heinrich Kreischer advertises in his newspaper um, in 1881 that he's got Anheuser-Busch uh, on ice for five cents a glass at his bar. Um, so he is starting to distribute it. He's not the first Anheuser-Busch distributor in Texas, which some people have claimed. Uh, we've seen evidence that there is plenty of Anheuser-Busch distribution happening in the Galveston region um, in the early 1870s. Yeah, so this yeah. was about the time that the brewery was starting to go into decline due to these nationalized brands uh, coming in and, and taking over uh, the popular demand and such. So 
Um, he he did this as just kind of a, a way to, to keep in the business. He'd sell it in Hauser uh, Bush in addition to his block beer um, down, hmm. down in the downtown area. Hmm. Bob, uh, to follow up with you when I was doing that research on, on the Crusher Brewery, his uh, his last daughter died in 1952, and then the, one of the articles I was reading, it did mention that, yeah, just like they said, none of them had married. And in 1952, family interest then sold part of the property as a state park. Does that sound right, Gavin and Jenny? So they donated the property to the hosting Catholic Church just down the right. road from us um, with the uh, understanding that it would never be sold. Um, the hosting Catholic Church then sold the property to the Frischoff Development Company so that they could build a new church. And the Frischoff Company, as Jenny was talking about, they wanted to create this um, Bavarian-themed amusement area and neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't too successful. The neighborhood's still there. Um, but then the Frischoff Development, as it was starting to go under, they sold the property uh, to uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. When they were doing the archaeology there, you know, that that to me would be a a site that must have had a big prehistoric uh footprint in it just because of the the height of it the tunnels and everything underneath do you have any knowledge on that when they were doing the excavations there not specifically within the brewery complex area or in the house area but i do believe that there are some um finds kind of below the bluff uh, and that's just not within our um within our okay. sites to be able to, to go and assess. There were some um, some prehistoric finds found uh, at the house excavation, yeah. which, which uh, early on and very limited, but helps point to this idea that there might have been some outlying structures on the brewery uh, because there's more prehistoric uh, finds and more modern finds, and so that this area must have been covered uh, during the period of historic occupation. Uh, but there's not have any extensive um, prehistoric uh, investigations here. All that, all that Mason work, uh, and I know he was a Mason and, and, and very accomplished that. Do you have any idea if any of this was done with enslaved labor helping him with that? Or was that just him and his sons, probably? It's just him and his sons. Um, we have no evidence that suggests that Heinrich Kreischer uh, was an enslaver. We do know that the person that he purchased the property from um, that family uh, did have were, were enslavers, um, but yeah, no uh, no evidence for the Kreischers. Kreischer, as we mentioned, was a staunch uh, Union man during even through the Civil War, is what the, the obituary says. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether he simply supported the idea of the Union or whether he was anti-slavery is uh, to be found out. Yeah, he did have laborers too, though, and they were from uh, the area in Saxony, Germany. Um, they were. Uh, they came over and he hired them. Um, they had a place to, to live um, in the attic of the house as well as there's a laborer's cabin. So so he did have help with the brewery. There's no way he and his sons could do it alone, definitely. But no, no enslaved uh, labor. Do you know much about that framework, how that would have worked with the, the German laborers coming over? Was that through uh, one of these organizations, German organizations, or, or do you know? So by that point, most of those um, recruitment organizations had failed, and so I think it's just a word of mouth. Um, it looks, based on when we were looking at the census and then tracking some of these individual people in the census, it looks to us that uh, this was a Christ show might have been a place to settle. Hey, this guy's offering work to new Germans. Um, I've got a place to live in Christ's attic or nearby, uh, make some money. So it's for a few years and then move on to do other things in the LaGrange area. Mm. Interesting. There are quite a few thanks entered in the chat. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. So, and we do thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so 